All right, students, this is the supplementary lecture from last week. Um, since the topic of explaining why God is existence itself in Aquinas is a bit tricky, and I don't think that using the whiteboard feature in Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate would really do it justice, I made a little PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to record this video and post it, and then I'm also going to post a PDF of the PowerPoint. So in the first three articles of question three of the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas argues that God cannot be a body, that God cannot have any matter as part of him, and that God is his own essence. So we're going to go over exactly why material things cannot be their own essence. We're going to go over why immaterial beings must be their own essence. And then we're going to go over why God, unlike all other beings, is his own existence, which makes him simple. So, an individual will be this or that kind of thing in virtue of its essence. So we say Socrates is human because he has humanity. Plato is human because he has humanity. Plato and Socrates both share something in common, in virtue of which we call them human. This common nature, or essence, we will call humanity. And because they both have humanity, they both are human. However, Socrates and Plato are not the same individual. They're not the same individual because they have something unique in each case. Socrates has something Plato doesn't, and Plato has something Socrates doesn't. If Plato and Socrates didn't have anything unique to them, if everything Plato had, Socrates had, and everything Socrates had, Plato had, they would be the same individual. So we say Socrates is this man, because Socrates has humanity, that's why he's a man. And Plato is that man, he's human because he has humanity, so they have something in common. However, Socrates is this man, as opposed to that man because he has this matter. His humanity exists in this body. And Plato is a different man. He's that man because his humanity exists in a different bit of matter. So we can see Plato and Socrates both share the same nature, but they have different matter. And Socrates and Plato cannot be reduced to one of the two parts. Socrates is humanity plus this matter. Plato is humanity plus that matter. And just to show that Socrates and Plato can't be identical with their humanity, let's consider a hypothetical, an impossible situation. Let's assume Socrates was identical with his nature. If Socrates were identical with his nature, then to be human would be the same as to be Socrates. That is, if Socrates equals his humanity, then whenever we say something is human, we would say something is Socrates, because Socrates and humanity are the same. If this was the case, though, then something impossible would result. Namely, Plato would be Socrates. So if Socrates were identical with his humanity, then Plato could only be human if he had humanity. But we've assumed that humanity in this situation is the same as being Socrates. So to say Plato is that human would mean that Plato is that Socrates. Now, if Socrates is identical with his humanity and Plato is not Socrates, then Plato can't be human, because we assume that Socrates was identical with his humanity. So Socrates is not Plato. So if Plato is distinct from Socrates and Socrates equals humanity, then Plato cannot be human. Plato cannot have any humanity in him. But that's false, because Plato is this man and Socrates is that man. Therefore, an individual material substance is not identical with its nature or with its matter. So Socrates, a whole, has two parts. His essence, his humanity, and his particular matter. Right? Socrates is not his humanity, rather his humanity is a part of him. And Socrates is not his particular bit of matter, the matter, the atoms, the elements that make up his body. Rather, they are part of him. Same thing with Plato. Plato is not his humanity. His humanity is a part of him. 
and Plato is not his particular matter. He's not identical with the parts that make up his body or the cells that make up the organs or the molecules that make up the cells or the atoms that make up the molecules. Rather, they are parts of him. So let's get a slightly more detailed look at the composition of material substance. So this is a little more technical, um, but just follow along. If you uh, had me for human person or if you read Aquinas for human person, this may be familiar if you've taken metaphysics before at all uh, in terms of Aquinas and read his book on being in essence, then this is all familiar. But if not, we'll just go through this quickly. So let's break down that statement, Plato is this human, a little better. So you say, Plato is this human. What's a human being? A human being is a living body made up of organs, a particular kind of living thing. And a living thing is alive, Aquinas holds, because it has a soul. So Plato is a human because he has a human soul. But humans aren't just defined by our souls, we're also defined by our bodies, because our bodies are part of us. And we have a particular kind of body. We have a body made up of various organs, right? Our matter is, our, 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 the matter that makes up our body isn't just any old kind of matter. It's heart, it's blood, it's muscle, it's bone, right? It's cartilage. So Plato is this kind of material substance because of his essence. His essence has two aspects. His soul, which animates his body, and the particular kind of body, the particular form of the parts, right? The particular form of the parts. Now that essence is common between you and Plato and me. We all have the same kind of essence. We all have the same kind of soul and the same kind of body parts. But we are individuals distinct from each other because this essence exists in our particular bit of matter. Now insofar as that matter may change through our lives, as far as we uh, recycle cells, as far as we take on more food and we grow and we we absorb matter and, and, and we convert it into, we convert, you know, uh, you know, steak into muscle or whatever. Um, uh, that designated matter is added on, but we're still the same individual because that designated matter that's added on is actualized and is determined by our essence. Okay, to go one step further then, in our analysis of material substance, we would say that here the matter that's previously steak, but now is my muscle, is something that is in potency to being either steak or being muscle. So matter can take on various forms. Matter can, can change states. Matter can, can become parts of different things. So the matter is in potency to being this thing or that thing. My matter is in potency right now to being ash. If you were to burn my body, it would turn to ash, right? The same matter would now be ash and no longer be human. So the matter is in potency to various kinds of things. The essence, which I have, my soul and the particular structure of my parts, are what make my matter to be human. Therefore, the designated matter is in potency and the material essence, the essence that I have, is an act of that matter. So the matter is stands to the potency, stands to the essence as potency to act. It's for this reason that Aquinas says, since God cannot have any potency, God cannot be a body or have any material part, because the matter is a thing which is potential, it must be actualized. Since God as first being cannot be actualized by something prior to him, because he's first, God's act cannot be the act of any potency, so God cannot have matter because matter is a kind of potency. Let's move on now, and, and, those, and those, all those points that we just made uh, in terms of God apply to Aquinas' um, articles 1 and 2 in question 3. Let's move on to the analysis of immaterial substances. So immaterial substances obviously are immaterial. That means that they lack all the material aspects that you and I have, or that Plato has, right? So what are the material aspects of Plato? They are his designated matter, right? His designated matter. And then those aspects of his essence that are determinations of the matter as material. So the idea of the matter being formed into these various kind of organs, these various kinds of body parts. So an immaterial being 
will not have any body parts, so it won't have any designated matter, and its essence will not include the structure and arrangement of any body parts. So an angel, let's take St. Michael the Archangel, for example, is immaterial. Therefore, since it's immaterial, unlike Plato, he does not have any designated matter indicated here in red. And since his essence is not the act of a of, of matter, it's not the act of a body, his essence will not include any generic bodily structure. There's no bodily aspects to his essence. There's no act of a body in his essence. So St. Michael will have an essence, which makes him to be an angel. And that's it, right? What made Plato this person was his designated matter. What, what made Plato human was his soul and his the form of his body. Where St. Michael, as an angel, just has essence. So then you may wonder, how do we distinguish between different immaterial substances? Since immaterial substances have no essential parts aside from their essences. This means that immaterial substances can only be unique. You can only have two different immaterial substances if each substance has and is a different form or a different essence. So since an angel is just its essence, if we have two angels, let's assume St. Michael and St. Gabriel, take them as angels, they can only be different individual angels if they have different natures. Different natures. Because there's nothing else that St. Michael could have that St. Gabriel could lack. There's nothing St. Gabriel could have that St. Michael could lack other than their essences. Whereas you and I share a common nature, but we differ because we have different material parts making us up. I have this matter, you have that matter. St. Michael has no matter which is unique to him and is not shared with Gabriel. And Gabriel has no matter which is unique to him and not shared with Michael. Therefore, the only way there could be two distinct immaterial substances is if each immaterial substance had its own unique nature because each immaterial substance is identical with its nature. All right, so since God is pure act, God cannot be, uh, God must be his essence since if there's no matter in him, just like with St. Michael and St. Gabriel, God will not have any parts of his existence which are potential since essence is an act so it makes something to be this or that thing an act it makes saint michael to be an angel it makes what makes saint gabriel to be a different kind of angel god will have his essence identical with himself there'll be no other parts essential parts to god other than his essence all right so that takes us through question Three, Article 3. Now let's get to this distinction between essence and existence. And this can be a little tricky, but I'm hoping that these diagrams are helpful. So Aquinas argues that there's a real distinction between the act of essence whereby you are human and the act of existence whereby you exist. So for Aquinas, we say Plato is human because he has a human essence. He has humanity. He has the soul and the particular form of the body. Right? On the other hand, on the other hand, when we say Plato exists, when we say this human exists, Aquinas says Plato exists because he has an act of existence, and this act of existence is not the same as his act of being human. Plato is this thing because of his matter. He's this human. He's human because of his humanity. And he exists because of a third thing, an act of existence. And this act of existence, you see, is drawn outside of the box representing the intrinsic parts of Plato. And that's because Plato can gain or lose existence. What makes Plato Plato is not his existence, right? What makes Plato Plato is not his existence. I can have an understanding of Plato even if Plato's dead, right? I can think about Plato even when Plato's dead. And that's because I can say Plato is dead. Why? Without contradiction. Why? Because existence isn't part of what Plato is. It doesn't belong intrinsically within that black box that represents Plato. So then, this distinction between essence and existence will apply to both material and immaterial creatures. Plato exists means this human, right, this composite of humanity and matter, possesses an act of existence that he gets 
extrinsically, that comes from extrinsic cause. Likewise, St. Michael, this angel exists, means this angelic essence possesses an active existence. And the reason why the active existence is distinct from the individual and distinct from the essence is because all these individuals are beings that can either exist or not exist. And as far as they possibly exist and possibly don't exist, we can say that they have a potential for existence. They are in potency to existence. So the act of existence is the act of the thing that potentially exists. So the individual substance is to existence as potency is to act. And more particularly, in the case of St. Michael, the individual substance is an essence. So we could say essence is to existence as potency is to act. However, when we turn to God, we will see that Aquinas holds that God's essence is not distinct from his existence. His act of existence is identical with his divinity. God is existence. And this is because God, like angelic beings, has no matter, so he is identical with his essence. But unlike angelic beings, God's essence is his act of existence. It's not something external. And let's go over this. So, St. Michael the Archangel, his essence includes the potential to exist. This is because he's a thing that can exist or not exist, right? If, let's just follow Aquinas' reasoning, there is a absolutely necessary being, and all things that are absolutely necessary beings are called God, anything that's not God is not absolutely necessary. It's something that exists dependently, right? It either is a contingent being, it both it exists at some times and not at others, and when it exists, it depends for its existence on some cause, or it's a dependently necessary being. So it's something that can't be destroyed, but it only exists because something holds it ex in existence. As long as it has existence from a cause, it can't be destroyed, but it still depends on that higher cause for actualizing it. Now, God is the first being, and the first being since we proved that a first being exists, is the is actual. And as first being, therefore, an actual God is the first act or primary act. And a primary act cannot have any potency. The primary act cannot have any potency because a primary act is an act that does not depend on anything else. The act of a potential is an act that depends on an external cause. So the act of so the actual existence of, for example, uh, shape in a piece of Play-Doh, right? So if I, if I have a ball of Play-Doh, the spherical shape is an act of the Play-Doh. But that act has to be put in. The Play-Doh has to gain that shape from an external agent. Someone has to actualize the Play-Doh's potential for being spherical. God is first being and act has act, but that act cannot be actualized by something else. Because if it was actualized by something else, that being would be prior to God. But by God, all we mean is absolutely first things. So whatever is absolutely first cannot have its act from something else. It cannot have an act which is the act of a potential, because the act of a potential is always caused. Since God is first being, God is not caused, therefore God's act cannot be caused. Therefore, God's act of existence cannot be caused. Therefore, if God's act of existence is not caused, God can, cannot have a potency to exist. Because if he exists and has a potency to exist, his act of existence must be received from a prior being. But there is none, since we're talking about the first being. Therefore, God's act of existence must be identical with his essence. So Aquinas concludes, therefore, that to be divine... To be God is the same as to be existence itself. God is completely simple. God has no potential. God has no parts. God is divinity, and divinity is existence. Therefore, if anything is, divin is divine, if something has divinity, then that being will have existence necessarily. God has existence necessarily because God is identical with the act of existence. Now, you may be wondering, this is our last little point here, 
that this might sound similar to the ontological arguments we saw with Descartes and Anselm, right? Anselm argued, God is that than which nothing greater can be thought, and that than which nothing greater be thought must exist. Therefore, since we have the idea of that than which nothing greater can be thought, and that than which nothing greater can be thought must exist, God exists. Likewise, Descartes argued, God is perfect, a perfect being cannot lack existence. Therefore, God, as perfect being, has existence necessarily. And since God has existence necessarily, there must be a God outside my mind. The difference here between Aquinas' doctrine of divine simplicity is that God is a necessary being and God exists necessarily. That God exists necessarily is a conclusion that we cannot know to be true unless we first prove that God exists. That is, we first prove that a first being exists, that a primary being exists, that an uncaused being exists. And we do that with a causal argument where we go from the effects in the world to prove there must be a cause of features of the world. So our knowledge here begins with knowledge of the world and we prove that there must be a cause of these features in the world. That cause is uncaused. That cause, that uncaused cause is God. So once we prove that there is a God, then we can argue to the conclusion. And this God exists necessarily. First we prove that God exists, and then we can conclude that God exists necessarily because of the kind of thing that a first being is. Yeah, We prove there's a first being, then we conclude a first being exists and moreover, must exist necessarily. Anselm and Descartes, though, get it the other way around. They, they begin with what Aquinas, find, what Aquinas thinks is a conclusion, that is, God exists necessarily, or God has existence necessarily. They take this as a premise, and they say, if God has existence necessarily, then God actually exists. I, if God has existence necessarily, then there must be a God. They get the order of argument backwards. Aquinas first argues, that there is a God, and then he concludes from that that this God not only exists but exists necessarily. Anselm and Descartes say God is a necessary God is something that exists necessarily. Therefore, there is a God. So they get the entire order backwards. All right. I hope that it helps uh, you out with that reading. I will be posting this to Blackboard, and I will be seeing you in the next recording.